thank you all um, so very much for um, being here. Please, please take your seats. Uh, this looks like a wonderful event. My name is Moisan Mostafi. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Design. And I just want to take a couple of minutes before I pass on the baton to um, our wonderful organizers to really take this opportunity to thank you all uh, for being here tonight and also to thank our speakers, the, our wonderful panel, um, in advance of their presentation. Uh, this uh, event is, as I said, is important for the school. It's part of a um, series of, of events that has been organized. Uh, we've had already a few conversations at the level of the school community within the context of our, our um, Dean's Diversity Committee um, after the events um, uh, in Ferguson and really as recently as yesterday in South Carolina that uh, have just shocked the, uh, the nation to really um, uh, be together to, to, to see what we can do together uh, because uh, these events are, are uh, issues that really um, affect the nation, affect uh, the university at large, and of course they affect uh, the Graduate School of Design. Um, I think um, tonight, of course, the, the focus is uh, more on the connections and, and relationship uh, between uh, questions of form and justice. The title of uh, tonight's uh, presentations, Informing Justice, of course, touches on questions of information, of formation, and of form, and their relationship to issues of justice. This is, I'm sure, something that our panelists uh, will discuss in, in detail. I think at the school, there is been a long history of uh, the, the discussion between, um, between um, spatiality and, and questions of, of justice. Uh, the topic of spatial justice is something that, that is, is discussed at many levels and indeed whether, what are the kind of questions of what are the correlations between design, form, and democracy. What, what, does, a, what does spatial democracy imply? I don't think we, for a moment, believe that this is something that can be resolved purely at the, at the level of, uh, of the school by itself. This is why we have um, so many people from different fields um, here, and that it's really the collaboration together, the, the, the working together that, that uh, will hopefully lead to both um, reflections, but also um, um, some, some recommendations, some solutions. And I see with the tables and with the four colors, some evidence of action. Uh, that is about to, to take place, which is always a positive thing to really see uh, where we go from here. Uh, we intend to have uh, more conversations, more gatherings after this, so your, um, your decisions in a way, your conclusions, your recommendations, your thoughts are going to be very, very important uh, for the school in terms of how we, uh, how we follow on. I do want to take this opportunity to thank the um, African American Student Union, the Loeb Fellowship Program, and the Joint Center for Housing Studies for really coming together, collaborating together, um, and making this event uh, possible um, tonight. And uh, without any further delay, I'd like to invite uh, Chris Herbert, who's the Managing Director of the Joint Center, to come and speak to us about the plans for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Moisen, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really a, a pretty dreary night here in early April after a long winter, but I'm really encouraged by, by the number of people who have turned out for this really important discussion. Uh, I, as Moisen mentioned, this, this is uh, an event that really is a continuation of conversations that started in the fall, 
and really was precipitated by the community meeting that was held here in this room that the dean hosted in December at the urging of students to address the, the horrific events that had happened in Ferguson and in Staten Island. Uh, and that really highlighted the tremendous uh, disparities in justice that exist in this country. Um, and I think that the, the events of this week have really, you know, the, the shooting in South Carolina, just another reminder of really the continuing uh, horrific levels of injustice that exist. And so certainly the need for having conversations is, is really uh, significant and important. And, and the issue, I think, is, you know, obviously what happened in Ferguson, what happened in Staten Island, what happened in South Carolina are issues that relate to injustices in the criminal justice system. And so I guess one question might be why that, how that relates to issues of design and planning in the built environment. But I think they really do highlight a broader set of injustices and failures that are, exist in our society uh, that really define life's opportunities and chances by race and ethnicity and class. There's just, in essence, a really strong spatial component. And I think what these events have really highlighted is that where you live matters a tremendous amount. Um, and in fact, I think if you look at the story of Ferguson as a suburb, it really is a microcosm of issues of racial segregation in this country. In 1970, Ferguson was a community that was essentially lily white. And then over time, uh, the community, blacks moved into the community and it became integrated. But that integration has not been stable as, as whites have fled. And the community has not been an area of opportunity. That path from the city to the suburb that had been a path of opportunity for whites was not a, a path of opportunity for African Americans. And I think what that tells us too is that this issue about uh, that the shadow of injustice follows people and that we can't just assume that people can move to opportunity. We have to really work on having places be places of opportunity. And so I think that this discussion is about how do we deal with spatial issues and, and bringing, making more equitable and inclusive communities. Um, now back at that December meeting, many people spoke passionately and eloquently about the important role that design uh, pract practitioners can and must play in building these more and inclusive uh, communities. So inspired by that discussion, the LOBES, the African American Student Union, the Joint Center for Housing Studies, and the GSD administration have, have designed this event to continue that conversation about the importance of the built environment um, in, in, in addressing these issues of inequalities. Um, there's a number of people here you'll hear from. I just want to quickly thank um, of the people who helped plan this event uh, among the Loeb's, Jamie Blosser, LaShawn Hoffman, Mark Norman, Thaddeus Pulowski, and Sally Young have all played an important role. From the African American Student Union, Dana McKinney and Hector Toretto Picard were also instrumental, and Jen Malinsky, Kerry Donahue, and the Pam, Pam Baldwin at the Joint Center were also uh, played key roles. So with that, let me just give you a broad overview of how we're structuring this evening. As much as we wanted to stimulate um, thoughts on this issue, we also want to uh, engage people in conversation. So we've structured the evening to that end. We're going to start off with a panel discussion, which will people who have been devoted to these issues to trying to create more equitable uh, communities will share their perspectives, their experience, their ideas as a way to stimulate our thinking. But we didn't want to leave it there. So that after an hour of that discussion, and um, we'll have uh, opportunities for people to comment via Twitter as that goes on, we're then going to break it down into each of the tables. We've set this room up in tables so that people can actually engage with each other in the conversation. We'll have people help facilitate how that conversation will go. We'll do that for about a half an hour, and then you'll have your report back. And the goal there is to identify well, what do we do? What, what are the steps we do as a profession? What are the steps we take as a community to try to address these issues? And so I really hope that we we're doing here is going to inspire, we're going to have uh, ideate, and then help lead to implement uh, how do we make the world a better place. Um, so with that, um, uh, just want to remind you that this event is being webcast as well, and we do have a Twitter handle, uh, Informing Justice. And so as you have comments or questions, you can, you can tweet those, and they will appear on the screen, and so we can have an ongoing dialogue as we go. Um, let me introduce Michael Hayes. Um, he's the um, Elliot Noyes Professor of Architectural Theory and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the GSD. He'll be moderating the panel discussion. Michael was one of those eloquent voices at the event in December who really spoke passionately about the imperative of incorporating a social justice perspective into both education and practice. And so we're really pleased to have Michael uh, here today to help facilitate this conversation. So please uh, join me in welcoming Michael, and Michael will introduce our fabulous panel. Black Lives Matter. I want to insist that that's, this is where we must begin this conversation tonight. Um, I want to suggest that to foreground race and racism in our discussions, 
uh, of space in design and specifically racism against black people rather than the generic uh, discussions of justice and inequity that we also must have, I wanna insist that it's time to foreground race. This is not to say that uh, the other discussions aren't important. We need to also talk about gender. And of course, there are other races um, as well as genders and sexualities that have to enter into the discussion as well. But again, I think my point is that we've been shy about talking about um, race. I almost said gun shy. Um, uh, and I think we, we have to sort of stop uh, our continued covering our discomfort about, about these issues, and we have to foreground it. So that's my first point. I wanna, I wanna ask that we foreground race. My second point is that we try to talk about form. And I didn't uh, entitle, I, I wasn't in on making the title, but I love the title, Informing Justice, because the, of, the, of the emphasis on the form. Um, it, it's difficult to talk about how design and race are going to intersect, I think. Um, however they intersect, it's gonna be highly mediated. It's not gonna be direct. It's not gonna be simple. It's gonna be oblique. But, but since, since design is never merely a, a, merely a practice of sort of technical uh, organization or construction of a building or an urban space uh, or, or a landscape, since design, like law, like politics, like religion and, and other disciplines, is a very self-conscious formal organization of material and spatial relations, for that reason, form can be and must be discussed and approached as ideology. And I want to try to bring those, those two desiderata that we foreground race and that we try to talk about race and this interaction of form uh, to begin the dis discussion tonight. Um, and we have the panel to, to, to do it. Uh, as we've been talking to each other, sort of planning this, the panel is constantly talking about that how we can use what we know as designers, how we, how we, how we can target, uh, what, what we, how can we, sorry, how we, can we target uh, that which we know about um, and, and bring our kind of cultural competency to bear. So, so let me uh, introduce the panel. Liz Ogbu, uh, an alum of the Master of Architecture program here, here at the GSD, designer, urbanist, uh, social innovator. She runs her own multidisciplinary um, design and consu consulting practice called Studio O uh, and is on the faculty at UC Berkeley uh, as, as well as teaches courses at, at Stanford's D School, but we don't talk about Stanford's D School so much, so much about. Um, it's really good to see Liz again, as, as it is Teresa Wong, uh, who is also an alum of our architecture program for the GSD. Um, soon after leaving, um, Teresa uh, set up, became director of the community design and planning at Skid Row Housing Trust in Los Angeles, um, and she'll be talking about that experience tonight. Uh, Kimberly Dowell, trained as an architect at uh, Cornell, is now the Sheila Johnson Leadership Fellow at, uh, at the Center of Public Leadership at the, at the Kennedy School here. She, she'll graduate from that program in May. She's also a licensed architect and has done real estate projects in New York. But, but she's co-founder of SEED, which is Social Economic Environmental Design. SEED's mission is to, and I'm quoting, advance the right of every person to live in a socially, economically, and environmentally healthy community. And then finally at the far end is, is Setu Jones. Uh, Setu was a Loeb Fellow here recently. He's, he's an artist who's created over 30 large-scale public artworks, including three, uh, uh, work for three stations along the green LRT line in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is where he's based. He also teaches at, at the University of Minnesota. Uh, in addition to the Loeb Fellowship, SETU has received numerous awards. I'll just mention the latest, the 2013 award for the Chicago Joyce Foundation, um, where, where he created a project called Create Community. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a community meal service, uh, a, 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 a project that focuses on access to healthy food for over 2,000 people in a half mile, long, in a single half mile long table, which I hope you'll also talk about. 
So welcome to all these people. Um, I'm going I'm to, I'd like to begin, if, if I could, with Liz. Um, Liz, Liz was a, a, a student here. As I said, she set up her own um, own studio, which I hope she could talk about. But um, I'm, I'm also interested in hearing sort of uh, maybe maybe what we'll do is is briefly make make a pass a, a kind of um, description, uh, a brief description, and then use that information on the table to start going around with the longer conversation. So, Liz. Great. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. It's really great to be here to be able to participate in this conversation, especially thinking back to my time here and issues that were of importance when I was here. I actually wanted to start with just telling a, a personal story. About seven or eight months ago, I was participating in an event in San Francisco where I live. And uh, it was an event attended by a lot of well connected, many of them very wealthy folks in the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley. And as part of the event, we were uh, doing different breakout exercises. And one of the breakout exercises was to pair up with someone and tell them your life story in a minute, um, which if you've never done is actually really hard to do. <laughs> And so I was paired up with um, a woman who is the wife of a very influential figure who I won't name. And uh, I got to go first. And I told her all about growing up in Oakland, about the fact that I went to Wellesley and then came here to Harvard, did my master's in architecture, uh, worked for IDEO.org, have a, my own practice now where I'm doing projects for Unilever and the World Bank and also teach at Berkeley. And I also mentioned at the beginning of my story that my parents are immigrants. Uh, both of them were born and raised in Nigeria. My dad came here, um, ended up becoming a professor at Berkeley, and I actually hadn't gone back to Nigeria um, until I was 16. That was the first time. After I finished speaking, she said, you know, your story is so impressive and so inspiring. And she went on to say a couple other things. And then she paused and she said, and you speak English so well. <laughs> And um, I think God smacked is an appropriate term to describe how I felt at that moment. And I said, yeah, I grew up in Oakland. Um, and then fortunately, we were saved by the bell. And uh, I, I explained that story not so much to say, you know, woe is me. This is the burden I have to carry as a woman of color. I mean, that was not the first time that something like that had happened to me. Unfortunately, it will not be the last. But I want to explain it just to sort of posit it against the work that I do. So a lot of my work is in what I describe under-resourced communities, um, communities in need. And they're often communities of color. They're often communities where um, there's a lot of poverty. And on the surface of it, when I go into many of those communities, if you look up at the skin color, I, it's exactly the same. Right, um, And I can relate to some of the situations that they've probably had, as evidenced by the story I just told you. But um, there's a difference. You know, whereas with that woman, I was sort of at the low end of the privileged totem pole in these communities that I'm dealing with. I'm actually on the high end. I can go into those communities, but at night I get to go home to my gentrifying neighborhood. Um, somebody has given me money to do something in that community, which already gives me some power. And so I set that up to sort of say that, you know, race, and privilege and class, these are not simple concepts. They're not, excuse the euphemism, black and white. They're actually really complicated. And part of the reason why they're complicated is that they're really embedded in human emotions. And that is not an easy thing. And so for me, one of the things when you start to talk about how do we put this into practice and what I try and wrestle with in my work is how do we engage that humanity? One of the things that was most hurtful about that situation with that woman wasn't so much that it happened, but that I, in wanting to tell my life story, I had come with an air of vulnerability. I had wanted to share myself. And when I'm dealing with a lot of these communities, the folks that I'm dealing with are doing exactly the same thing. They're coming vulnerable. And if I can't hold space for them, like she didn't hold for me, then actually that's going to be at a detriment to the project. And so one of the biggest things that I bring in, in the work is actually trying to figure out ways to make sure that I'm being vulnerable that I am fully aware of all the baggage and assumptions that I'm bringing into a situation, and I'm willing to also embrace them being vulnerable, because it's not a one-way street. The other thing that I've found that has been really helpful is this idea of um, intentional listening. So going in and actually showing that I want to hear what they're saying. I said many things in my story over the course of that minute with that woman, but clearly she didn't hear everything that I had to say. And so it's really important that when you're engaging with these communities of figuring out ways that you're making sure that you're actually listening and then being able to reflect back. And then the, the final thing, um, and I think I had slides, um, 
which may not be coming up. Oh, do I have to come up there and do it? Okay. <laughs> It's a very mobile speaking engagement. Um, so um, I just wanted to kind of, because uh, Michael had suggested that we use examples as much as possible to show how this might play out. So this is a project I'm working on right now in San Francisco in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood, which for those of you who are not familiar with San Francisco is pretty much the poorest district in the city and by a lot. A lot of the public housing is there. It's a historical African-American community and there's been a lot of injustice and equity over time. And this is a big 40 acre redevelopment project that I'm working on with a couple other firms. And one of the things that we found is to actually show that we, this community had participated in a lot of different planning workshops long before we came to the table. And to show that we were intentionally listening, it was a point where we actually had to put design in place. So we actually created a listening booth on our site. Um, invited people to come and tell their stories there, and we partnered with StoryCorps. So every story that's told in that booth gets uh, archived in the Library of Congress, and it was a very intentional act of showing we're listening and we're remembering your stories. Um, and from that, we've also found that there are other ways to listen. So, you know, with kids, they weren't going to sit for an hour in the booth, and so we've actually employed arts workshops with them to try and get what their stories are and what their vision is in the community. And then the last bit that I wanted to say is also this idea of authentic engagement. Once you listen, how are you sharing back to them that this is a dialogue and you've heard what they've said? Um, and so what we've done as part of that is, in the things that we were hearing, there are real needs around health equity around housing equity, but there's also some serious issues in terms of they felt that nothing ever happens in that place, nothing that they can feel proud of, nothing that is actually fun. Um, and so one of the biggest things that we did in this past year, and all of this is from hijacking our community engagement budget, um, was to host a circus. And uh, in that circus, we actually had 650 people show up. Nobody had ever seen that many people come for anything in this community, nor had they seen a crowd that diverse. And so for a lot of the people that we've talked to, for them it really, they came and they said, you heard us, and you, you listened to us, and now you're doing this. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, but I think those three things, being vulnerable, intentional listening, and authentic engagement, for me are sort of the important thing of just even starting the conversation before we get into what we normally recognize as true design projects. So Teresa is going to speak now. <clears throat> I just want to echo a lot of the the thanks for all the organizers for putting together this event. I think it's important and timely, and and it's actually very nice to see the GSD try to take these issues on um, head on. I thought I would also, um, similar to Liz, talk about really the way that I found myself to doing this work and really how I'm also grappling with the integration of this equity piece um, into my own design practice. So I wanted to start with this image because I think it really frames what we're talking about. Um, it was at a planning meeting or a planning workshop last year where we had this really kind of light touch activity where we wanted community residents to really define what are the components of a neighborhood that they want to have? And I think this comment is really timely. You know, all neighborhoods, including Skid Row, should have police that don't arrest, harass, or kill you just because you look black, poor, or homeless. Um, all neighborhoods should have neighbors that watch out for each other. And I think we all realize that this is a huge, kind of larger social social issue. Um, and is there a role that design can play in this? You know, is there a role that the designer can play in addressing this social issue? And I think. Um, we're all in this room because we want it to. Um, and I think as a way of starting, um, we need to really think about how we're defining design and really begin to broaden it um, beyond kind of what are the aesthetic or technological outcomes associated with our work. Um, so, um, you know, it, it becomes sometimes hard when I think you define design in more of a social justice context. So actually, once I graduated from the GSD, I took a left turn and, and did community organizing work. So this is a photo from when I worked at the Design Studio for Social Intervention. And it, this was really more of what design looked to me. You know, it's about um, how do you overlap multiple publics and 
in public space? How do you engage and activate and really break down boundaries so that people who may not ordinarily interact, interact with each other? You know, very different from you know, the studio projects that we're used to working on for four years. Um, I think absolutely the implications and application of design thinking was really important. Um, but also I started to realize after you know, working a few years in community organizing, the permanence of the built environment was something that um, I really missed as a person trained as an architect. And so I was fortunate enough in 2009 to receive the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship, which really started to synthesize my community organizing work, um, but also my training as an architect and a designer. So I moved from Boston and went cross country and landed in Skid Row, Los Angeles, which I think is probably one of the most um, obvious forms of inequity or injustice in the built environment. So for the, almost for the past six years, um, I've been working within the community and really trying to understand what this like, social outcome piece um, in our work really is. And so for the first few years, I worked on, a, um, so I worked for a nonprofit organization, it's called the Skid Row Housing Trust. I was placed there as a, as a Rose Fellow. Um, and we, we developed um, affordable housing for kind of the, the most vulnerable, lowest income homeless community in Los Angeles. Um, but we also provide services and we worked with, we work with um, wonderful architects to really build um, generous, active, um, high performing spaces for recovery. Um, and this is the Star Apartments that we worked with Michael Maltz in architecture. And, you know, as a housing project, it, it has high impact. Um, but when you're dealing with a community that you have over 3,000 people living on the streets, you know, without a permanent place to call home, um, you know, the merits of the project, it is aesthetically beautiful, it's prefab modular construction, um, kind of the, the programmatic elements are really what begins to have transformation. So this was the first project that um, the trust, we implemented a participatory design um, input process, but also started to really challenge the typology of affordable housing to include more um, community building activities. But within the, the the context of Skid Row, housing isn't the, the sole solution. And so um, as a way to kind of scale up some of the work, we, we launched a community planning process last year called Our Skid Row in hopes to really reframe um, a place that tends to be thought of as trans, uh, transitional or transitory um, to really reframe, reframe it as a place of you know, equitable permanent living. And so um, this has really been a project where we're trying to really demonstrate what it means to try to use design as a way of reallocating power and distribute decision-making possibilities. So even, you know, so I wanted to kind of give concrete examples because I think that becomes helpful in the, in the discussion. So even little things like research or mapping or existing conditions, which this is, um, we made sure that it was um, engaged with the community. So oftentimes, in Skid Row, our residents are the subjects of research. We wanted to really subvert that relationship and have now the residents be the actual researchers. Um, so going around, mapping all the assets in the community, but really interpreting and analyzing um, their, 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 where they live um, with their embodied experience. Um, we also tried to increase the decision-making um, opportunities by having participatory design workshops, but beyond, really trying to engage on a deeper level. So we're not just asking people to choose between colors or finishes. Um, we're having the community residents really generate the actual solutions. So they're, they're projecting the outcomes that they want, the programs that they want to see, so that really the, the solutions are based off of um, their embodied experience. Um, and also trying to really leverage as, as many resources in the places of privilege that we have as designers so that we can really create a more robust process. So this is from a series of design resource workshops that we've had where we bring, in, we invite designers from the surrounding community and then we bring the community experts to the same table and collaborate. So I think in many arenas, you know, the designers work behind the curtain here, but also community organizers work behind a curtain here. So the goal was to, you know, come and collaborate um, and work together, uh, framing the issues, but also generating solutions together collectively um, at, at, at one place. And I think another goal with a lot of the work that we do is about how do we um, change the narrative. Um, I think a lot of times, 
some of this work, you know, we have embodied implicit biases and it's not always really addressed. And so by being able to change the narrative, is there a way that design as a process or a project can build more empathy um, so that, you know, we're not creating this other category but really understanding it's more of a we? Um, and then just wanting to ask, you know, while we're in this room, how are we personally engaged? You know, whether it means on, on, a, on a, 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 me, Teresa, as a person, you know, I ask the audience members, you know, are, how are you civically engaged? Do you vote? Are you out in rallies? Are you out in marches? And, and kind of what is your political presence in all of this? Um, in addition to professionally, how can we begin to control what we have access to in order to um, create more equitable outcomes? Thanks, Teresa. And now, uh, Kimberly. So, um, so this is me, Kimberly Dowdell, with a lot of letters behind my name, which means that I'm a licensed architect. I care about sustainability. Um, I also was a founder of, of SEED, which Michael mentioned, uh, which again is social, economic, environmental design, which. Um, I found it based on my personal story, which I'll, I'll get into now. Um, so beyond all of all of these, you know, fancy titles and letters and things, um, I'm actually just a girl from Detroit, um, and uh, I'm the, the granddaughter of the the two people who are on either side of the bride. Um, the bride is my aunt Irene, and this is her. Um, so this is actually the house that uh, my grandparents bought in 1947 when they moved to Detroit from uh, from from Georgia uh, to escape uh, the segregated South. Um, so they moved to Detroit in 1946 when my mother was six months old, and then they bought this house uh, the, the following year for $6,500. Um, they were one of the first um, black families to integrate this particular neighborhood. Um, so this was a, you know, it's a working class neighborhood. My grandfather worked for a Ford Motor Company. My grandmother, she cleaned houses. Um, and so my aunt was married in 1963. So this is a, a photo of the of the house. Um, the, the actual wedding was like at our church, but um, this is just a, a photo showing um, just a little bit of, of the of the house, um, which you know my grandparents essentially bought um, as you know bought into the American dream. Um, and I actually spent the first nine years of my life living in this house on the east side of Detroit. So um, unfortunately, this is what the house looked like in 2011. Um, this is not an uncommon story. It's um, sort of something that, that's happened all around Detroit, all around um, you know many other American cities. Um, and you know, part of, there are lots of um, reasons why uh, you know this particular neighborhood turned into this, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. But I just wanted to sort of show the contrast. You know, where there'd be a neighborhood where people want to have a, a photo of their of their daughter's wedding to an abandoned shell, and then unfortunately following year, the uh, American dream that my, grandpa my grandparents envisioned was gone. So, um, and th so the, the, just to, to back up a little bit, so I spent the first nine years of my life in this house with my mom, and then the neighborhood just got so bad, we actually had to move to another area in town. And I think my mom um, intended to, to rent out the house for like additional income, but um, unfortunately, as soon as we left, um, looters came and like took literally everything. I remember going back in with my mom shortly thereafter and they took literally the, like the kitchen sink, like everything was gone, like the toilets, like everything. So you really can't like, you can't really recover from that. So essentially, um, you know, that's, that's why when we left the home, we weren't able to, um, you know, to really do anything with it. And that's something that just happened all over the city. Um, so that's, that's actually another neighborhood in Detroit. Um, the top picture is from 1949 and the lower picture is from 2003. And it, I mean, it just goes to show that this is a pervasive issue, um, which is sort of what um, <clears throat> what what caused Detroit to to become what it is today. So a lot of these things are um, sort of what inspired me to go into architecture. I think um, around age 11, I remember um, being in downtown Detroit and noticing that a lot of the the buildings were like boarded up, and it's just you know just like not a very vibrant vi vibrant place. And I said, oh, I have an idea, I'll become an architect and I'll, and I'll fix it. Um, I later realized it was a little more complicated than that, but um, that was sort of the original dream. Um, so in pursuit of this, of this dream, I went to, uh, to Cornell to study architecture. 
And um, to, to get a Bachelor of Architecture, you need to do a, a thesis. So my thesis actually was focused on uh, what happened in Detroit. I really wanted to understand some of, the, some, some of the issues that led to that. And then, of course, I had to actually design like, a, a project to kind of address it. But um, essentially, I looked at um, you know, just some of the historical issues, which I'll, I'll talk about probably later in the discussion and answer, or the question and answer um, portion. But <clears throat> essentially, when the great migration of um, blacks from the south to the north happened, a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of you know, racial tension started to emerge. Uh, you know, there were riots, um, not only in the 40s, but also more um, drastically in the late 60s. Um, and just, I mean, a lot of policy issues, a lot of, um, you know, just racial strife. Um, also, uh, if you take a look at the changing population, it just goes to show um, how African Americans were 42% in 1970, but then by 2000, they're um, 81%, and then sort of the inverse happened with, uh, with whites, and then Hispanics are, um, you know, slowly growing. Um, but some of the issues that I uncovered in my thesis were, um, or that I, that I kind of tried to address were blight, where do the vacant lots come from, which I you know, mentioned in my story. Um, poverty, crime, racial tension, segregation, disinvestment, abandonment. So there's a pretty heavy issues for an architectural thesis, but I tried my best to kind of stitch it all together. But um, part of the reason why I'm at the Kennedy School is to try to understand um, how do you build uh, coalitions, how do you create sort of um, interdisciplinary teams to solve these really, really complex problems because design is not going to fix what's wrong with Detroit. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of different issues. So one of the, uh, one of the issues that, um, that I uncovered um, during my thesis, but even more, um, more deeply within the last year, the Kennedy School, issues like redlining, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, um, which if you aren't, essentially it's where, um, it's, it's a policy that, uh, that was pretty popular in the, f in the 50s and 60s where um, essentially, if you literally take a red line and um, mark a piece of a map, you would say this area is really only for um, for black people. So you um, um, so they wouldn't be allowed to like issue mortgages or mortgage insurance. So basically, um, that's the only place where where blacks could um, you know could buy something. So and then another issue is restrictive covenants. So let's say you are a black family who could afford it. Um, you didn't need a mortgage, they're so like, oh, sorry, the, um, you know, the previous owner said specifically no black people can, can buy this house. So it, regardless, there was just, um, you know, just policies in, in place that, that sort of prevented um, diversity in, in a lot of communities. So then um, after the, the riots of the 1960s and then um, the infiltration of drugs in the 70s and then crime, so it's, it's like layer upon layer of, of issues. So that's kind of what... Um, you know, what, what I tried to, to look at in my thesis and then what I'm sort of working towards now. Um, oh, the other way. So, but to bring a, a little more hope back to the picture, actually as a, as a practitioner, I've worked on a project in, um, uh, I've worked on several projects in New York um, and New Jersey, and this is a project where I was the project manager. Um, and, and many people know, just like Newark, you know, Newark has very similar issues to Detroit. Um, and uh, this park, military park, um, was actually a, a, like a pretty bad place to be, uh, probably even two or three years ago. But um, a public-private partnership was established um, actually about 10 years ago. But it actually just, um, we just opened the park last year. But essentially, um, this was a place where you didn't want to walk. Um, you didn't want to be in this park after dark, especially. You'd find like drug paraphernalia on, on the ground, um, you know, just like a really sort of bad place. Actually, I should show a before and after. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, you can't really tell like the, the drug thing from here, but that's what it, <laughs> that's what it looked like before. Um, so I actually took those pictures from the, the office where we had our meetings. But um, so I, I showed this project, one, because I actually worked on it, um, and two, because um, it just goes to show that when you, when you do build partnerships between um, public and private actors, you can actually begin to, to do things that improve um, improved communities. So this particular area, again, I mentioned is, um, you know, it has some crime issues, um, but the, um, I'm sure many people are familiar with um, Bryant Park in Manhattan. Well, the, um, the redeveloper who led this project also did Bryant Park. So the, essentially the model is, hey, there's this, you know, great, you know, high potential urban space that, um, 
and we just need to kind of provide a little TLC to you. And so they use the same kind of model to, to do here at Military Park in Newark. And so they, um, they work closely with uh, Prudential, which is building a brand new tower right across the street, um, as well as um, the city of Newark itself um, and several other foundations that were in the area. So they pulled the money from all of these different sources um, and just you know, created a partnership to um, there are several key things that are that were done beyond design. I mean, yes, we you know we, we retain you know a great design firm to build these two little buildings that are um, in the aftershot sort of nestled in the trees. It's basically a comfort station so people can use the restroom um, in the park as well as um, a small burger pavilion. Um, but you know we've added programming like yoga in the park and um, you can watch movies. Um, we've created um, you know better landscaping um, plan, landscape plan. And then also, more importantly, we actually raise funds to staff the park full-time security. So, you know, so there's better lighting, there's security staff, there's maintenance staff. It's actually a park that's maintained. Um, and so that really sort of made the difference. Um, and so this is the park today. It just, it just opened before I started school in, in June. So uh, we had the ribbon cutting. People are actually sitting in the park, using the park. And this is, I mean, night and day difference from... Um, where it was before. Um, I think this is my last image. So um, I just wanted to show a nice picture of the park and let CSU go. So. Thank you. Do, you have, do you have slides? I have no slides, so I'm not moving. <laughs> <laughs> At least not right now. <laughs> uh, and tonight, first I want to thank the organizers of this event. Uh, this is a, a grand and great opportunity for us to continue to come together uh, around issues of race, class, and gender, and design. And I want to talk about, actually, I don't want to talk about the role of design. What I really want to do is to talk about the role of designers, of each one of us, and our responsibility. On April 4th, 1968, and I'm going to be going from my little moleskin uh, <laughs> sketchbook here, too, with my notes, but on April 4th, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and 130, oops, and 130 cities exploded uh, across the country, and after four days, uh, on April 8th, on this date here, on this very date, 47 years ago, uh, those, that urban unrest began to wane. Although the sparks that were lit in the 60s were ignited from time to time throughout that summer and summers after and a few summers before, and it really wasn't the death of Martin Luther King that ignited those fires, but it was this pent-up anger at the collective condition of African-American communities, the poor, and the poor. It was the redlining, the, the disenfranchisement, the poverty, the disinvestment, and our relationship to power. All of that affected design infrastructure in many, of the, in many neighborhoods across the country. And John Loeb and a few others felt that the design professionals had not done justice to American cities. And working with Bill Dobo and John Loeb's gift created the Loeb Fellowship. So here we are, 50 years later, and black men are still being killed by the police. And we're still having this discussion about design in communities of color and poor white communities. So how do we stop repeating the same historical mistakes over and over and over? Now, this is a big task. You know, all we have to do is eliminate races, eliminate structural racism, get off the hyper-capitalist train, and embrace a new world. Easy. <laughs> But we really have to take it in small chunks. We really need to think about what is our role as designers and planners in changing the world. And I want to remind all of you all, in particular, 
the students that are here, that at some point in time, you're going to join a professional organization. And each one of you will belong to the AIA, APA, the ASLA, and remember that you're going to sign a code of conduct. That code of conduct will cover and address you know, all the professional and the legal relationship that you have with your client and, uh, and will set out those business practices that you should follow. But each one of those codes of conduct also asks members not to discriminate based on race and sex. It also asks members to uphold human rights in all of our endeavors, everything that we do. We really need to keep that in mind. And as I said, your real job is to change the world. And design for a fair and just world is the right thing to do. I mean, that's why we're here. We're doing this not because of metrics, not because of analytical data, but we are here because this is the right thing to do. And I'm going to close here, and I'll, I can go on and on, but I'm going to close here with words of Martin Luther King, kind of where we started, that are paraphrased. And at one point he said, on some positions, caution asks the question, is it safe? Expedience asks the question, is it quick? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscious asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we all must take a position that is neither safe, quick, popular. We must do this because conscious tells us it is right. And so we're here not to become millionaires, although maybe some of you will. <laughs> uh, it, and it's going to be hard with a student debt low <laughs> to get there. But we're here because we love what we do. We're here, really, and, and all too often in forums like this, we don't spend enough time talking about love. And we're here because of this love and this passion that drives us. And along with that comes this responsibility that gets back to what Martin Luther King described as the beloved community. And that's what each one of the panelists have begun to describe and to build. And I ask that all of you all participate in building that beloved community. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Uh, I was struck without any uh, planning to this effect that all of you spoke from, from a very personal position. You, you, you spoke about personal experiences even back to childhood uh, or, or experiences si since graduation. There's something in there that I, that I can't quite pull out, but there's a reason for that. I, I think partially to me it's something that, that Liz said about, about privilege, that when, when you were talking about privilege, um, as a black person, you, or, or thinking about privilege as a black person, you think about education, you think about certain income, um, certain place. White people don't think about privilege. Um, and I think it's because it has something to do with choice. I was thinking about um, when Kimberly was talking about growing up in Detroit. I, did, I didn't grow up in Atlanta, but I was a student in Atlanta. And right after graduation, of course, you have no you have all the debt and no money. And, and I lived in some pretty little high crime, concentrated poverty near areas in, in, south, in south of Atlanta. But, but I always felt like I had made that choice. Whereas I think there are conditions where because of race and racism and the designed sort of real estate that Kimberly was talking about of sort of designing to, to keep white people out of certain communities and to keep black people in. Because of that, black people sometimes don't have the choice that even 
that every white person has, no matter, no matter their income, don't, no matter their other situations. I think it's a very asymmetrical uh, starting point to come, to, to come from that. Um, it makes me think, too, that part of the work we're doing, and I think the reason things like this are so important, just like the, the, the event that sort of initiated this that, that Mosin and Chris were referring to earlier, um, part of it is just talking to each other and remember, and, I mean, it's, it's not like in academia, we don't constantly have discussions, but we don't have discussions like this. We're not upfront with each other. We're not, we don't make ourselves vulnerable, as, as Liz was saying. And I think that that's a very important thing as, as academics to, to remember where, from where do we speak, right? What is, from what position are we, are we speaking? Um, it's a good thing to remember. I wanted to ask um, first Liz and Teresa, um, because you're both teaching, Teresa mentioned this just before we started that, that when you were at the GSD, because there's such a high concentration on issues of form in the uh, Master of Architecture program that you actually felt some tension even. And uh, could you talk a little bit about how some of these concerns that you voiced enter into your teaching, or, or and I'm, I guess I'm asking also for recommendations and personal stories, but, but for, how do they enter into your teaching as opposed to your, your practice? Um, you know, I think um, now that I've been able to teach a few design studios in the past few years, um, definitely the way that I've set up kind of the way that the, the course unfolds, um, we never jump to diagrams or form within the first, I would say, six weeks of the course. Um, I, I realize, I think, something that we don't discuss um, in design pedagogy is really what is the role of the designer in terms of a leadership capacity, and really what are the tools that we're given in order to be an effective leader, right? So whether we're um, engaging in a conversation about form or larger social issues, I think we still need the facilitation tools. And so when I've been teaching studios, um, kind of the first two, three weeks have been about how do you speak to a community? So all my studios are contextualized within a community context, whether it's Skid Row or, or somewhere else in Los Angeles, um, and it's all participatory. So the goal is first, I already know you know how to do Rhino and Render and Illustrator, all that stuff. The goal is um, how do we now equip you to be more effective when you have kind of basically your client meetings. And so trying to expand um, what we're learning in order, in order to include cultural competency, facilitation, and, and really leadership development. Yeah, I, I think I take a very similar approach to Teresa that uh, a lot of the courses I teach, we also do very contextual projects, and the whole idea is before you even start to get to analyze any place, I actually want to take away, I think this vulnerability thing is connected to eliminating the distance. I think if you're looking at people as subjects that you're trying to observe, it's very easy to separate yourself from the realities of what they're doing or take it in such a hypothetical, rational way that you actually don't get into the real meat of stuff. And so one of the first couple of exercises that I do with my students is a lot about themselves, about their history, about the places in which they grew up, really getting to think of that in a really personal way and bridge the gap between that personal history and space. And then there's a whole series of coaching of like how do you go out and start talking to people in the community. And so before they can even start to think about the design project, part of analyzing the neighborhood is just having conversations and interviewing people, but interviewing them in a conversational way. And we do coaching around the best ways to do interviews, places that they can do interviews, questions that they can ask. And so what I have found is that naturally this starts to seep in. So in the beginning, I'm scaffolding a lot, but by the time we get to the end of the course, they're doing it on their own and they're getting excited and they want to go back out and integrate more interviews and more community engagement as part of their process of design. So I think it's really about giving that lift initially and, and really setting the tone that this is a fundamental part of the course. And then over time, it gets, it, I, mean, I think one of the reasons why we don't do it is that we're afraid of it. It's really scary. And so it's about bridging that fear and that it's okay to fail, it's okay to screw up in a conversation with a community member. But if you approach that as something that you're gonna learn from, then you can get past it and move on to that next level of engagement. Mm -hmm. And and say to and Kimberly, um, I'm interested to, to hear a little bit more. I mean, Kimberly talked about it about about your practice, but I'm interested to hear a little bit more about how um, 
opportunities are initiated or discovered or how, how do you make opportunities for the kind of community involvement that you were showing in places like Detroit. You've also done real estate work in New York, right? And any, uh, it's, it seems like a lot of your practice is, is making opportunities for things rather than responding to offers of opportunity. And could you talk a little bit about how that, how that works? And also say to a similar thing as an artist, commissions come along and, and projects are offered, but a lot of what you do is, um, is sort of ex, ex nihilo. I mean, it, it's, it's out of nothing sometimes. Right. Sure. So, um, so my, my approach is to try to be as proactive uh, as possible. And so that's sort of why I've been transitioning more so from traditional architecture to um, real estate development, just to kind of um, be a part of the decision making process early, you know, as early as possible. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I'm at the Kennedy School to really start to understand um, how all of these different pieces um, come together. Like design is a really important piece of the puzzle, but um, you also have to like finance these things. So I took finance last semester. I was like, this is really difficult. But um, but I, I like I passed, so it was fine. But um, and I also, I mean, I took real estate finance. I took all these other classes. Um, you know, at the Kennedy School, actually here at the design school. I'm at the law school now. Um, you're taking one class at the law school. So, really, I mean, really my approach has been, um, you know, how do you create an environment for interdisciplinary problem solving? So that's really been the focus of, of my work since I've been here at the Kennedy School. I'm also a fellow at the Center for Public Leadership, um, which, is, which is focused on training, you know, the next generation of leaders to solve really complex problems. And um, I've, had, I've, been, I've had the honor of being um, in the first cohort of Sheila C. Johnson uh, Leadership Fellows. And um, essentially the 10 of us this year, um, you know, we're the first group and we're, uh, we're charged with addressing disparities in underserved communities. So I'm the only architect, but there, you know, there are people in public health, in politics, in law, in, you know, just a really wide range of things. And we're just trying to figure out how do we, how do we fix Detroit? How do we fix Newark? How do we fix, you know, these just really complex, super, you know, um, hairy issues. Um, and so in terms of creating opportunity, I think it's, um, really about asking asking good questions, creating the right um, networks, um, you know, really sort of building um, a team of people, a diverse team of people, um, you know, for, in every sense of diversity you can think of. Um, so that's that's really been my mm -hmm. my approach. You know, I've really used uh, a really uh, several different approaches, and I have I'm really fortunate and really blessed to have to be able to earn a living from commissions. You know, that's really what's kept me going. I mean, you described the uh, uh, integrating artwork into three of these stations for mm -hmm. light rail. That was this large contract, biggest thing I'd ever signed, and it was multi-year. And, you know, I was working on other things. I also do some, I also do theater, set design. Uh, but I've used all of that personally <laughs> as a way to support my real work. And I encourage all of you all to, if you have a vision, and, and you can hear, hear that in, uh, in the panelists who started these organizations and started these organizations from scratch. You know, I've been able to use my commission work to subsidize my real work. And many times that real work starts with an idea and I encourage you to follow that vision. Uh, I, it, this larger work that I do was able to help subsidize, also uh, Michael described, this meal. I have been working uh, with food-related issues. And in fact, at the University of Minnesota, I teach a class on urban food systems that I alternate with a class on, on stormwater management. Uh, integrating uh, art into stormwater infrastructure is really what I've been focusing on. And, and so it's so being varied and being willing to take on tasks that sometimes you might not know <laughs> where to go. You know, many times I will go into an interview and I'll say to folks, sure, sure, I can do it. And, and and then have to put it together, have to figure out how to put that together. But anyway, uh, I just this past fall helped put on a meal for 2,000 people at this 
table one half mile long. It was in my neighborhood with my neighbors. Uh, and I had to work on generating interest, support, and stakeholders for folks in my neighborhood. It was, its focus was on healthy eating because all too often I would see people walking past my studio windows in one direction and coming back a few minutes later uh, with bags of groceries knowing they had just shopped at the local convenience store a block away. And probing a little bit further, looking at the food in those bags, it was primarily processed food or food in boxes. And there again, I thought, well, you know, what's a brother to do? What can I do? And I, I thought, well, I'll put on a meal. I'll invite all these folks to dinner. And it was a way of demonstrating what a healthy meal was. That was just part of it. It had a lot of different layers to it. But saying that to say that a lot of that work was subsidized by my professional work. And you're going to have to figure out all kind of ways, angles, schemes, and scams to get <laughs> to your vision and to begin to change the world. Thank you. So I want to take a little turn here. We're going to come back to the panel. But um, we, we had hoped that, that part of what this uh, an event like this would do would be to begin to produce topics, um, and and uh, there would and, and and topics that would we would continue to discuss in in subsequent um, events. And and two of our Loeb fellows, Jamie Blosser and Mark Norman, um, have been monitoring the discussion. Uh, Mark is looking at Twitter. I don't know how much how many Twitters came came in, but I'm going to ask them to <laughs> see if they can start to. Uh, isolate maybe some topics or, or, um, or themes that, um, that then we'll use to turn to this kind of more active part. Thank Jamie. you, and thank you, Michael, and, and to the panel and the Joint Center. Um, yeah, this is sort of the, the beginning of the interactive piece and why we have tables in Piper. Um, we all work very deeply in community, as, um, the, as you just heard, and so we very much felt like this needed to be a dialogue. And so your voices tonight are very important. And I just kind of want to summarize some of the things that I heard from the panelists and then turn it over to Mark and see what he's seen on the, the internet. Um, but we, I, I heard a lot about how personal this is, as Michael also said, um, but that we all have a sense of responsibility toward this um, and that there's some ethical considerations in moving forward with this kind of work. And I think that's a big question is how, what is our responsibility as planners and designers in addressing issues of inequity? Um, what can we do in the process of design and even in our own practices to break down those barriers, to engage, um, to interact as some of our, our panelists uh, discussed, um, and to take a position uh, and, and that, so much uh, about this is, is based on these sort of implicit biases, the fact that we all come with a different lens, and that it's, it is very personal for some of us. And um, by the way, I, I want to make sure that we all take that to heart as we talk at our tables and, and keep that here so that we are keeping that respect at the table as well for that different perspective. Um, but changing that narrative is really critical. Um, and, and that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's, it's hard when you're doing a pinup, perhaps. You don't want to be vulnerable at that moment, but, but working with community and working with the teams that are needed to pull this work off uh, is essential to have that kind of openness and humility and vulnerability. Um, I also want to thank the panel, and the tweets have been coming fast and furious, and um, I think there were a number of things. I think. One of the um, things that I'm most impressed with is, even from the pictures people are tweeting, um, they're saying that a good start is actually this panel and the diversity of the panel, not just um, racially and, and from a gender perspective, but also just from the perspective um, you're bringing uh, to the discussion um, in addition to the audience. And um, I think there are just a lot of uh, sort of themes coming through. I think Liz's uh, statement about being vulnerable, um, but also about telling personal stories, which I think is a way of um, 
addressing that vulnerability and putting it out there to everybody else. Um, I mean, I would also say maybe we put some of that vulnerability back on some of the people that tell us these stories. Um, we could have a whole conference on um, awkward statements we've heard people tell us. Um, but um, I think uh, there, there are also a number of issues around um, how we practice and um, how we participate, how we listen, and um, uh, especially the phrase that uh, Setu gave us, uh, we don't spend enough time talking about love, uh, which is very poetic, I have to say. Um, and Kimberly's statement about public and private actors, that it's not necessarily one side of the table or the other, um, that we're not gonna solve all the problems by ourselves. Um, but that they're gonna be in coalition, and very different coalitions, I think. Um, but the, the tweets are still coming through, um, and I think that some of the issues we'll talk about um, at our tables and then report out on uh, will be important too. Um, but I probably have like two, two and a half pages of notes yeah. just from They're coming that faster now that, you've, now that they know you're reading. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so please do tweet, and that's, that is the hashtag. But, um, but we'll also, as we talk at the tables, um, be taking pictures of what you write and draw and also what you say. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce the breakout session. Um, it'll be super easy, no anxiety here. Um, and you don't even have to move. Uh, so stay at your table. If you have extra seats and those of you up uh, in the risers would like to come down and join us. Uh, one of the things tonight is that uh, we're all participants uh, and, and all our voices are important. So please join us. Um, and then um, if there's any tables of, of, it doesn't seem like there are any tables of less than four. So feel free to, to come on down and join us. And can I ask the facilitators to raise their hand? Do we have a facilitator at every table? If not, if we have any extra facilitators, please keep your hands up and so we can populate tables without. So it's really wonderful also that we have faculty lobes and especially the African American Student Union facilitating tonight. So really uh, thrilled with the presence here. Um, so the way this is going to work is that we'll all just do a quick sort of 20 minute uh, session at your table with the smaller group and uh, so you'll have 15 minutes of that for discussion amongst the group and five minutes to sort of wrap it all up. Your facilitators are then going to come back and present your ideas to the group um, and so what we'd love for you to do is use the paper in front of you in order to draw and write your ideas down um, and so I'd like everyone to get your pen out or grab a marker on the table and just hold it up in the air for me. <laughs> no, really, everyone. <laughs> you and the risers, I don't know why you're still up there. Okay, so take the top off and put it down on that white blank piece of paper and write your initials on that blank piece of paper. Do it. <laughs> so now you own that paper. It's no longer blank. It's no longer sacred. And we really hope to see whatever comes out of your discussions to be shown on that piece of paper because your facilitator is going to use that to summarize your conversation. So I hope you have fun. And now your 20 minutes is starting. Thank you. 